combining innate leadership skills with honorable service to a community is something that reaps immeasurable rewards to both the giver and receiver. This brings me to our guest speaker today, Amanda Brown Olmsted. She's the CEO and president of A. Brown Olmsted Associates, or ABOA. ABOA is a PR firm that has regional, national, and international clients in various industries, including real estate development, healthcare, and manufacturing. They offer services such as marketing, research planning, analysis, and program management. ABOA works hard to assist organizations in positioning their reputation in the marketplace. Amanda Brown Olmsted is one of the PR's industry fellows, a distinction held by approximately 300 practitioners worldwide. She is fully accredited and is a member of the Public Relations Services of America. Amanda has been head of her own agency for 35 years and is known for her hands-on client service and respected for her counsel. She has also been designated as one of the top 10 Atlantans. Please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our speaker today, Amanda Brown Olmsted. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is absolutely my pleasure to be here. Um, I've spent a lot of time on your campus over the years. I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. Uh, but today I want to talk to you about something that I feel has been an underpinning of my whole career. Um, I want to talk a little bit about success and some of the successes that we have experienced together, the team at ABOA and, and, and our clients. But how do we measure success in the business world? Uh, is it money and profit? Uh, is it client satisfaction? Is it goals accomplished? Uh, is it emotional fulfillment? Is it the use of all of our creative juices at once? Or an adrenaline rush? Oh, well, candidly, it's all of that for me and, and a whole lot more. And today I want to share with you uh, some of my experiences and what has prompted me uh, to create these success stories through the years. Uh, when I began to think about spending some time with you today, um, particularly in that this institute highlights entrepreneurism activities, I've reflected over the almost going on 36 years that I have run a public relations firm and uh, to see what might be a thread or a theme that has gone through what has kept me pumped up and charged about this business and passionate for my clients for so many years. So now I'm in another chapter of life. Uh, I'm a little older, but you know, I've become more excited now about the work we're doing in our agency than I ever have been. Uh, and I want to recognize one of them, Thomas Smith over here, is an associate of mine in ABOA. And I said, uh oh, I'm going to get graded. <laughs> um, my theme is about being needed. I truly think that. When a client needs you, when a client, when your phone rings, we need to get together. That word need comes up almost every single time. And that really has become sort of the glue of my motivation. Uh, the most gratifying work we could do might be protecting a client in a crisis. Uh, it could be discovering or suggesting that we tweak a product or a real estate project or something that may be a menu in a restaurant. Uh, that sets the client off in another direction that helps them uh, achieve their goals. Um, certainly being in a service business, that's what we do, is really important uh, that we give service and we know what that means to our clients 24-7. If you're in telecommunications, and I'm sure a lot of you are uh, in technology engineering firms where products are extremely important, but if you're in a service business, the product is your brain, your heart, yourself, your energy. And uh, when you are the product, you really must savor that client and pour yourself into the activity. Um, when you are a product, there are no complaints allowed because you need to keep yourself as positive uh, as you possibly can to be the best product you can be. The harder we have to work as well is uh, it, there's, more to, there's more to give because somebody needs us so much. Our experience, our creativity, our passion, 
uh, it grows more and more uh, as we're needed. The Ritz-Carlton chain, I know all of you know uh, the Ritz-Carlton, this is a chain we helped launch and it is known for its customer service. It is known and honored by the Baldrige Awards to be one of the best. But if you'll think about that service, it is attached to a product, a stage on which they perform. They're not a service alone. Over the course of 30, almost 36 years, we have provided service for almost every industry category and thousands of clients and projects. Uh, one of my favorite was for the Georgia Tech Athletic Association under Homer Rice, and the year was 1990. Uh, Homer wanted to have his coaches and lead staff facilitated in discussion to determine what can we do to, be, to inspire athletes, uh, what can we do to determine the direction of the athletic association, uh, what can we do to make sure that our athletes perform well on the field, but also in the classroom. So Homer wanted an outside resource to come in and stir up that conversation and facilitate the question and pull the missions out of them. I did this in partnership with Bill List. The, you know Bill List that's on WXIA, most of you. He's a great guy. And we had an absolutely magnificent time working on your campus for the better part of a year. And part of the privilege of that year was that we got seats in the West End in the stadium uh, and got to see all of your home games. And we also got to go to the Citrus Bowl that year. Does anybody know what happened in 1990 at the Citrus Bowl? Absolutely. You were the? National champion. You certainly were. I'm well, I believe, I believe to this day that we brought great luck to the Athletic Association. Have you had another national champion since, since then? OK. All right. <laughs> you, they, they might still need us. Skyline. And he went to Central Atlanta Progress and he said, you know, before the Olympics, I think Atlanta needs to be the city of light, not Paris, for the world to see. So teamed with a CAP and Georgia Power, ABOA had the opportunity to work with the property owners up and down the Peachtree Corridor from downtown to Buckhead. It was a public relations campaign, it was a sales campaign, and we opened uh, in the fall of 95, with more than 70 buildings had l added uh, light to the sp uh, sparkling now skyline. It was really quite a thing to have an opportunity to participate. When Turner Broadcasting's Ted Turner decided that it was a shame that the Soviet Union had boycotted the LA Olympics, he went to Bob Wessler and said, you know, we need to do this again and we need to do it better, and we need to pull the United States and the Soviets together, but we need to invite the rest of the world. And that was in 1985 when they decided to do the first Goodwill Games in Moscow. ABOA competed with large multinational firms, but because we were also a part of a worldwide consortium of independent public relations firms like ourselves here in Atlanta, we could do that worldwide reach, and we did. We traveled all around the world uh, to bring in the athletes and the sports federations to sell the sponsors, grand media, and build the excitement for the games that were held in July of 1986. And we were really needed there because the communications, as you know, in the Soviet Union at that time uh, was so controlled. It was the Goodwill Games that broke loose, I believe to this day, in the influence of television and American television and advertising in the Soviet Union that helped bring the wall down. It was Soviets having an opportunity to see American television that made them realize that there was life outside of the boundaries of the city of Moscow. And talk about needed, well, two things. We did a, a do any of you recall the name Jane Smith? This was a little girl that had written letters to Mikhail Gorbachev and she went to visit him in the Soviet Union and subsequently died on a trip home with her father. So we did a, a national essay contest and art contest to take to the Soviet Union, and it was really quite dear. Uh, so that project was really needed in the course of, of the Goodwill Games so that it wasn't all about being commercial, it wasn't all about athletes, it was really about 
the, the warmth between nations working and playing on the stage together. Um, and one other detail, when we did the opening ceremony, there I was on the playing field for the opening ceremony conducting uh, a lot of the activities sitting in front of Ted Turner and Mikhail Gorbachev. It was quite an exciting moment in my life. We have had the opportunity to shape uh, public affairs efforts which uh, have led to peach care. We did a program called Babies Can't Wait. There was a need. We did a program called Traffic Safety Now that led to the seatbelt laws we have that are enforced today in the state of Georgia. Fernbank was only uh, open a couple of years uh, when it got into very serious financial trouble. Um, ABOA had been brought on to uh, publicize and to create traffic to the museum for this dinosaur exhibit that the largest dinosaur that had ever been discovered and that was discovered in China. And they had several uh, reptiles to come to the United States that had never been out of China. During that period of time, as they were in moment of crisis, we took this magnificent opportunity to turn around the thinking about Fernbank to get tremendous amount of grassroots support. And of course, they're doing fabulously today. Um, when the cyclorama at the Atlanta Zoo was closed for two years to be renovated. It was one of the few remaining cycloramas in the United States. And Maynard Jackson had only been in uh, office a couple of years. Anything with African Americans talking about the Civil War just wasn't comfortable. And the mayor was quite honestly a little concerned about participating in an opening ceremony uh, for the, uh, this cyclorama, which was about the Civil War. But we used our creativity to come up with a line and a storyline uh, that was the new cyclorama will turn you around. And it was our premise, and we had the stories to bear, that if it were not for the Civil War, uh, we would not have the society that we have today, one of equality, one of hope, one of great diversity and compassion. And so with that, we kept feeding these words to the mayor. He got excited about it. The media got excited about it. And to, to this day, the most media, with the exception of the Goodwill Games, I suppose, well, certainly in Atlanta, that showed up for a single press event were more than 60. The mayor gave an incredible speech. We made the evening news and the Today Show. When the Atlanta Ballet suffered a blow because the, the person that was in charge of development for the ballet uh, ran off with the, with the money he had raised at the largest fundraiser they had done. And everyone on the board said, I'm out of, he I'm out of here. Uh, Bobby Barnett, then the artistic director, called me and at 7 o'clock one morning and said, I must come over and talk to you right now. I didn't know what it was about. He came over and over coffee explained how everybody from the board had left. What was he to do? And I said, well, we are to build the board back. That was a moment in time for me. I mean, I thought this guy came to me and asked me to help him in this moment of crisis uh, and that I was able to do it. It gave me so much confidence. And at that point in time, I think really built our firm into thinking that we can do anything that we set our hearts to. Um, there's some other examples, and yeah, I'd love to mention to you. Uh, there, there, there's so many. But what I want to talk about as well, I want to stick with you, that if you move forward in your career, I know you've heard this, uh, with great passion, uh, with and it starts with recognizing that somebody needs me to do something. There is no job too small. Uh, everything matters. We all knit ourselves and talent together to accomplish things. And being needed is, is, and recognizing that is where it starts. Um, I've been on Central Atlanta Progress Board for more than 20 years, and I love downtown Atlanta. Um, as all of you know, and I love the urban texture, um, you're seeing a lot of that here with Atlantic Station and all the growth at Georgia Tech. I mean, the infill in our city is just amazing. Um, but what happened was, several decades ago, uh, as the interstate system was built, the urban sprawl thing happened, and downtowns were becoming vacant and crime was going up. 
we had a serious problem with the Atlanta Police Department uh, in recruitment. And I, I would say today that the police departments probably in the entire region still have that challenge. Uh, but uh, ADOA was needed, again, uh, to help see what we could do to, to motivate uh, recruitment. So we did a campaign called look, look at Our Lineup. And that lineup, a photograph, which we used in visuals on billboards and posters in military bases and colleges and universities and so forth, was diverse in its, its gender, in its ethnic mix, and the size and the age of the people that were there. And then we dug deeper and we discovered something remarkable, I thought. And that was that the people who were going into police service were doing it because they wanted to serve community. They had masters in criminology and sociology. Uh, they were accomplished in their military careers. And they wanted to continue something of service. Uh, it was a great campaign. And it won us a silver anvil, which is the uh, Oscar for the public relations industry. When health clubs in the late 80s, early 90s, I didn't look up the date, don't remember it exactly, um, were flat. The aerobics movement in health clubs had built over, you know, past two decades before then, and, and it was flat. There was a woman in Atlanta named Jen Miller who created step aerobics. How many of you done it? How many of you do step aerobics? Awesome, the older people, so <laughs> it, needs, it needs another comeback. Um, but at any rate, Rich Boggs, who had a business here, built something called the step. And these were plastic steps with units under them. And he needed, he, he had come up with the concept, but he needed somebody to sell them. And the health clubs needed somebody to resuscitate them. And so we uh, hired Nadia Komenich and Bart Connor and traveled the world to promote uh, the whole step aerobics movement and won another award. When Laura Turner Seidel called me uh, on Wednesday before Thanksgiving three years ago and said, I want to hook you up on the phone with Carrie Kennedy. She wants to come to Atlanta with her Speak Truth to Power program and do it at Ebenezer. And the Kings and Credit Kings said, that's fine. We'll do it with you. We'll help host it. Tied to the King birthday, so we're in that time period where this is quite relevant. In six weeks, basically, uh, we put together a Speak Truth to Power reading, which had actors such as Sean Penn, Alfred Woodard, Lynn Redgrave, Woody Harrelson, amazing cast of people, uh, filled Ebenezer, and more than accomplished the goals that Kerry Kennedy was looking for. And you talk about need, and Thomas will shake his head. <laughs> he had just joined the firm at the time. I mean, there was total passion around the clock and so we came out on the other side with great success. And of course, there are hundreds and hundreds of you know, stories like this uh, where we've been able to use our creativity and solve problems and help clients out and uh, help them accomplish their goals. Um, it's wonderful to be needed. Uh, but there's something that you must recognize yourself. You have to feel it. And you have to feel it in, in everything that you do. Um, it's funny to me how the word work is sort of a negative word. I mean, it's sort of like toil, or labor, uh, you know, burden, that sort of thing. That, that is the word that, that's what work has come to mean in our society all too often. And if you look at that whole live, work to play, environment, mixed use thing, well, the work part's the burden part, and the live, play is the fun part. But I really challenge that, because um, for me, work is fun. Um, Two weekends ago, I worked all day Saturday in Savannah, Georgia, in conjunction with the uh, groundbreaking and the sales beginning on an $800 million project called Savannah River Landing that's on the river, uh, which is an extension of the historic district and replicating General Oglethorpe's original plan uh, for Savannah. It was an exhilarating day. I was just thrilled to be, be there. I was thrilled to be a part of it. Uh, then I got in my car the next day, next morning, to drive to LaGrange uh, to do a, a retreat with another client. In fact, a project that is uh, going up in Atlantic Station. Have any of you seen the Millennium Gate, that arc that's going up in the middle of Atlantic Station? You've seen it? If you haven't seen it, go walk over there and take a look, because it's going to include a 12,000 square foot museum. It's going to be fabulous, and it's going to open late this spring. But as I was driving over to LaGrange, uh, a friend of mine I've known for a long time called me and said, I really need your help. 
and Fred Elias told me to call you that you were the one that could help me. And I am going to assist with the marketing of a new real estate project in Costa Rica, and I have no idea what to do, and I've got to go down there for a meeting, and I need some help. Well, we talked on the phone for about 45 minutes or so, and she would interrupt me and say, oh, I'm so sorry, I know you hate to work on Sunday morning. I do like to go to church, but um, I'm so sorry I'm bothering you, but thank you so much. So this went on, and she must have told me about three or four times that she was so sorry that she was you know, taking up my time on a weekend day, and I said, are you kidding? I love this. I said, I have 40 years of experience, and you're just allowing me to use it to help you out. That, to me, is, is, is a treasure and a treat. Um, so I can use probably every cliche and use some corny words and all that kind of thing to sort of explain why being in this service business of public relations and marketing and public affairs has done to sort of turn me on for so many years. Uh, I tell you a lot of stories about exciting ventures that we've experienced with so many companies, organizations, and individuals uh, who've trusted our ability to showcase them with the communities they want to reach. Um, I learned from my parents that by uh, giving of yourself uh, and recognizing that your efforts are needed in the community, uh, you have the chance of living well. Uh, therefore, our firm is very involved with what we call civic rent. I know you've heard that term, and giving back. We want our clients to give back. We want to interweave what we do uh, through the network in the community. Uh, and I really do believe that's a cornerstone of why we have been successful through the years. On June 1, 1972 is when I started my firm. And I believe I was the only, uh, the first female to start a full service PR firm in, in the Southeast. Um, and it was an adventuresome time for PR when people didn't know what it was and didn't even know what to ask for. Uh, so that was pretty fun because I could sort of create and paint a picture of what I thought our business should be, not dictated by anyone else, not necessarily dictated, but inspired by the industry standards and the information I got from my peers around the country through PRSA. Uh, my major, majors at Ole Miss were sociology and psychology psychology with unrelated majors in art and music. And I had no clue that that would lead me and help support me uh, in this career. Uh, but sociology, which deals with human behavior and so forth, um, gave me a great foundation because what we do in PR is we want to motivate human behavior. We want to change human behavior. We want to make people want to buy something uh, or vote for somebody. I mean, that's what we do. And then the art and the music and the creativity, well, creativity is not just painting. It's not just graphics. It's, it's problem solving. And the more creative you can be, and every time you approach a client or every time you approach a project, to think about what can I do differently this time, it makes it just that much more fun. So today, um, we have a fabulous array of clients. I'm just going to tell you some of the things we're working on. The Home Builders Association hired us because they needed us because this housing market is in a terrible place. We have a wonderful challenge and, and we'll um, work very hard for them. Uh, Atlanta Wealth Consultants is a startup company and they need our help in, in getting their feet on the ground. Uh, Beck Group is a large construction group based, based in Dallas and they have needed our, our help in creating awareness for them uh, and positioning them in the Atlanta market. The brain train. Have any of you heard about the brain train? Yes? Anybody? Please? Okay. Oh, that's the commuter rail that would go from Athens to downtown Atlanta, from downtown to Macon, and then eventually five other rail lines spoking out from an intermodal station in downtown Atlanta. One of them would service Georgia Tech, the one to Athens, which we dubbed the brain train because it connects so many colleges and universities along the way. The need there to relieve traffic congestion in our city could not be any greater. For our firm to have an opportunity to work on helping solve traffic congestion is, is a real thrill. Um, Gwinnett Village is the largest CID in the, in the state of Georgia. We're working with them. Um, I'm not going to read all of them. We're just starting work with a company called HOK that's one of the largest architectural firms in engineering and, and uh, interior design. 
And do you know where the old Sears building is out on Potts de Leon? There's going to be a project in there called Potts Park. But the heart of Potts Park is going to be something called the Medici Center, which is going to be an intentional village, a live, work, play, again, but a, an intentional village for scholars, where professors, the academic universities in the city, the CDC, the arts community, uh, those interested in, in, in environmental sustainability, all come together uh, to, to live in a community where there are forums and intentional exercises to bring brilliance together so that new ideas, just like the Renaissance, uh, can be born. Uh, can you imagine working on a project like that with, with that kind of vision and mission? Uh, it just makes you want to get up in the morning. Um, so those are some of the things that, that we are working on that we're very proud of. So to close my comments, there's been a theme here, um, and that theme is about being needed. You all will, those of you who are students, there are a couple of you who are not professors, uh, you're going to be needed more than ever. And, it, and it's quite different from being in school. There, you need to make a grade. When you get into the work field, there you need to make a difference. Thank you. And I would take any question you want to come up with. And please do. OK. A number of the students in here are future entrepreneurs. And could you give them some advice on, as an entrepreneur, how they can best leverage uh, PR firms like yours? And, Perhaps the value you add relative to firms that just do you know, pure advertising and that type of market development? OK. Well, first of all, I think that there is a, a general, in my opinion, misperception about what public relations firms do. And we do media relations. And we do help get the stories out with media. And now, of course, social media and internet and all that other stuff. But that's only part of what we do. I think the, the greatest value, and I stated examples of things where we came up with program ideas, we came up with product concepts and that sort of thing that truly help these businesses uh, find their success and find their sales goals. So when you start your own business, uh, or if you're in a small business, uh, seek the advice of a public relations professional. I mean, we will even sell you our time by the hour, just like a lawyer, uh, to ask you a lot of questions uh, with experience, for instance, at a firm like ours has had so many years, there's almost, as I said earlier, no industry we haven't worked in. So uh, we have things to compare it to. So we can ask you questions, uh, be a sounding board for you, help you shape your language, help you, help you shape how you talk about yourself uh, or your product or what it is you're doing in a way that's compelling. Uh, to the audiences you want to influence. So it's language, it's community relations, it's media relations, it's strategy, it's being a soundboard, it's being a trusted advisor. Thank you. You uh, made an interesting point about civic rents, I think you called it. Um, and it made me think about what do you do in advising your client companies to engage in civic rents or social responsibility? I'll cite an example. Uh, we love to get our clients involved in community kinds of activities. Sometimes we'll help uh, a CEO uh, get on some boards to raise their visibility. Uh, sometimes we will find a particular uh, charity or beneficiary that fits something that, that works with that company, that organization. Years ago, we were working with Blue Circle, which is, does concrete, cement, so forth. Uh, and they, I was at a meeting, and they said, well, someone had come to see them about putting a portion of the path, you know, the bicycle paths and running paths, the path foundation, do you know what I'm talking about, uh, through one of their uh, sites, through one of their property. And did I think that was a good idea? And I said, Oh, is that a, 
fabulous idea because what we need to do is we need to donate concrete to the, for those paths. We started a program years ago that is still going on today, and the program was go the extra mile. So that meant that if the PATH Foundation, which was all through donations and so forth, bought one mile of PATH, then PATH would donate the next mile. So it just, it just kept going and kept going and kept going. So in that case, we were able to marry uh, the, the, the nature of that client's business with a community activity where they've had great visibility, great ownership, and have made a significant contribution. We also used that go the extra mile internally. I mean, it's common language, obviously, but we built a campaign around that to encourage their employees to always, to, that customer care thing, that service I talked about earlier, to go the extra mile in everything they did. So it was quite successful. How do you measure the return on that kind of investment and what are some of the unexpected ways that it paid off for some of the clients? Well, that's always been the challenge in the, in the public relations industry is how do you measure it? Because it's like, um, well, it's like a chat room on the inter internet, for instance. I mean, one person says something and another, another person says something and it goes like this. So the point of origin to the point of purchase, uh, there could be many, many people, many organizations, many layers in between. So it's very difficult to measure. But generally what we say to our clients is this. Our success is me measured by that of our clients. If our clients are achieving their sales goals, uh, their reputation is being uh, lifted up and they hear it, or someone says, that was a fabulous article, or I just heard the nicest compliment about you the other day, we get that feedback and we know that what we're doing is working. We also know that it's working when we have satisfied clients. They are happy that we are there to meet with them and they continue to need our services. It is difficult to measure. But in the public relations industry, the silver anvils that I mentioned earlier, they are graded, if you will, on setting up the objective for what was needed for the program and to see if it was achieved. And it never is how much publicity you got. It is, did you do what needed to be done? And I think that's a, a misconception in our industry. A lot of people will measure their programs on how many clips or how many impressions were made, and that clearly is, is not. We were talking to someone today, uh, and an associate of mine said in that meeting, well, is it really more money you're looking for? I mean, is that the bottom line of what you really want, or is it more visibility? And they had to think about that a, a little bit, because in reality, it was more money and more do donations. This is a nonprofit that they really wanted, ultimately, but they didn't want the visibility. So they wouldn't have to pick and choose, because we could help them get more money by helping increase the uh, size of their board, by helping them network through other organizations, uh, so that their circle of friends would get larger. So it's an interesting, I believe, thing, challenge to us in this industry to make sure that whatever it is we do every single time uh, is being done with a strategy to help meet the goals of the client. Yes. Hi, I'm Craig Miller. I'm really intrigued by what you do. My question is, say I'm an owner of a company and I'm in need of your services. What is kind of the process that I would go through? OK. Uh, well, we have to get together. You know, it's like anything else. I mean, we've got to get together and see if we like each other, see if we can communicate well. And then what you're going to do is dump all of your ideas to us. This, this is my idea, or this is what I'm doing. And we're going to give you some feedback and let you know what we think about that. And then based upon that kind of interchange, we'll say, well, we think that your story is so compelling that why don't we look for a byline uh, opportunity in XYZ publication that will go right to your sweet spot, right to the people you want to reach. I mean, I just cite that as an example. Or it could be, let me introduce you to somebody. Or, it, it, you know, it's, it's different every time. There is no cookie cutter solution. And it wouldn't be fun the way it is if everything were cookie cutter. Uh, we think fresh every day. Yes. 
So have you ever had the situation where uh, you missed a key component in the demographics and the PR backfired somewhat? Hmm. I just simply can't think of one here on my feet right now. Uh, be more specific. Give me an example. In, in the way that you portrayed uh, the company, maybe a certain ethnic group found it offensive, so it came back to them that they didn't have more sales. I hope we have never done that, but let me tell you a little story about this firm. Uh, right after we uh, got in business, uh, a guy named Ray Abernathy was very close to the King family. And so it was when Coretta Scott King wanted to build the King Center. And so Ray was working on the f first fundraiser to build the King Center, and we got involved with that. I also um, decided early on that we would be very diverse in everything that we did. And so our motto was, because people would say, do you specialize in the industry? And I would say, we specialize in diversity. And when I said that in 1972, the word diversity, the way we use it today, wasn't there. But it evolved into that being a real cornerstone of our firm. So it's a place that we've always hopefully been extremely sensitive and uh, you know, empowering uh, to all ethnic groups as far as our staff is concerned, makeup, as far as the clients we've worked for, and, and the causes and so forth that we've worked on. Yes. Ah, oh, good question. Well, first of all, you need to be a, a very, very good uh, at juggling uh, multitasking, you just, and particularly if you're in the agency business. Uh, I mean, on one given day, I might need to be doing something on as many as 15 different clients in a day. So you have to multitask. That's one. Uh, you are much more reaction-oriented to be effective in the public relations business than you are process oriented. <laughs> Things just don't go A, B, C, D, E because we are interfacing with the news and issues of the day and that sort of thing. And as those pieces move around, we have to fit into them somehow and play off of them with our clients. So multitasking uh, and, and being real flexible is one. If you are too process oriented, you probably aren't suited for this. Uh, you have to be a good communicator, both yourself and your written skills. Uh, writing, good writing skills is still very fundamental uh, to the public relations industry, uh, many of whom have come into the field through journalism. Uh, so there's that. Then I also think well, energy, you have to have a lot of energy. <laughs> and I also think you have to have a sixth sense about problem solving. Um, and that's what makes it fun. I mean, if you take those little tests and you look at the, you know, which flags met, met, don't match the other flag or whatever, you know, those kinds of tests, you have to be able to think like that on your, on your feet. Um, what advice would you give um, to an aspiring entrepreneur of, say, a service company about obtaining, like, their initial clients? That's a good question. I, I really believe that the way to get your business going uh, is networking. Uh, I mean, you can join organizations where you meet folks, uh, got a business card, <laughs> you know. You, you've got to be able to tell your story very uh, effectively. Uh, and, and you use your friends and family. Uh, you use your church, your Fraternity Alumni Association, I mean, you use anything that you've got that will help get you to people who can uh, buy, purchase your services. Another thing is to now, with internet and you're being able to Google industries and that sort of thing, uh, if there are particular industry groups where your service is going to be focused, meet the people there, do some cold calling. I mean, those are some of the things. I mean, when you first start a business off, and if you are you know, kind of funding it yourself or with a small uh, SBA loan or something of that nature, 
uh, you really need to get it going a bit before you invest in outside marketing and services and that sort of thing, in my opinion. Does that help? Are the, the PR firms as price, uh, under pressure for pricing as other kinds of companies? When you go in, how, how do you know what to expect, what, what cost of things should be? That's a good question, too. Uh, I don't think that the public relations field is finding the cost pressure the way many, many other industries are. And when I say many other industries, I would say architecture, landscape architecture, a lot of those fields that, that Georgia Tech goes into, the competitions are so fierce and so superior and so well done and are so expensive to execute that it is really hard uh, for those, those kinds of service businesses. The advertising industry has also, um, and we knew this 30 years ago, uh, was going, the PR industry is going to take a lot of big bites out of the advertising industry. And now, with so much media and so, uh, and so many channels of specialty publications and all because of what technology allows, you know, advertising firms aren't as profitable as they used to be. But right now, uh, the public relations industry seems to be booming and growing and filling in a lot of gaps that other businesses, even management consulting firms that are charge a tremendous amount. A PR firm can do, provide a lot of the same kind of strategic services that management consultants can do. So we're, we're doing okay. Sure. My question has to do with, um, it must be real fun when you're called in because someone needs you to get out a good word, but what happens when you're called in because of bad news? And is there a certain spin that you won't give to bad news or certain clients that you won't no. uh, work with? And how, 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 do you, how do you deal with uh, adverse situations? Very interesting. Okay, I have turned down very few pieces of business, but I, uh, I did turn down a anti-abortion campaign because I'm pro-abortion, okay, pro-life, I mean pro-choice. Um, but most of the crises that we have been involved with, I mean, you talk about thrilling, adrenaline rush. I mean, that's when you have to pull on all of your best thinking uh, to, to help as, as, as much as you possibly can. We have done everything from hostile takeover of the firm and survived it, uh, hotel fires where uh, lives were lost and we had to help them get it back together so that they could continue, uh, a meningitis breakout in conjunction with a fast food chain that was a client of ours uh, and how to deal with that. So there, there are, you know, there, there are many crises that we've worked on. Okay, here are the things. We don't use the word spin, it's a bad word. <laughs> Because what that people think that means is they're not telling the truth. They're covering something up. Clearly in a crisis, uh, and, and I think that uh, Internet technology in this transparent world that we live in has really helped a great deal in that regard. Because candidly, you're, everybody's exposed all the time. And if, if any company tries to cover something up, they're going to get themselves in big trouble. What we do is we go in and we want to know all the facts and tell the story over and over and over, make sure the facts are correct. Because what happens during a crisis sometimes, and if you probably experience it on your, in your own life, people get excited and then they start saying things that aren't true. And I don't know why that happens, but it happens. And so we need to be the, you know, the, the, the rock there for our client uh, to help wade through uh, everything that everyone is saying make sure we've got exactly the facts. The next thing we want to do is figure out what are the solutions. Uh, any of you that have a problem or want to go to a teacher with a problem or in a job you've got a problem to take to your boss, you also need to say, what about this idea? Think of a solution. So when you then are addressing the media, uh, shareholders, uh, and so forth with what the crisis has been and what exactly has happened. You also talk about what you're going to do about it next. Uh, and then you continue to feed 
the media and those interested parties of each accomplishment as you make it until you're over the hump of that crisis. Joel, did you have a question before I turn it Yeah. We... And this will be our last. The, uh, when you and I came along, you've named some years and I'm a little before that, but the best advice I could give then for somebody starting out like the students was to volunteer at every opportunity. In other words, if you went to work for Bell South and uh, Georgia Power was in charge of United Way or that kind of thing, and you had the opportunity to volunteer, uh, that was almost an, that was the best path to growth in the industry. Now one of our three pillars here is the corporate social responsibility. I was wondering if you could connect that in today's um, situation with the students. How important is volunteerism to their career path today? Well, absolutely, and I think I've said that several times in my, my comments earlier, and I was talking about your networking thing. Volunteering, joining organizations, getting out and meeting people uh, is absolutely how you move up in an organization and create visibility for yourself. There was an article uh, written by an AP writer, didn't we talk about that yesterday, that um, uh, was saying when, business, when times are tough, how do you keep your business going? And there was a, a woman in the public relations industry in Florida who said, look, if I'm at, at the grocery store or at the PTA, you know, I'm talking to somebody to see if maybe they could potentially be a client in the future. So, I mean, it's everywhere. But Joel is right. It is uh, volunteering as a student. Let me tell you that when I get resumes and I'm considering hiring someone, I look as intently at their extracurricular activities and their volunteering and other things they do uh, as, as I do on their grades and the courses that they've taken unless there's someone that's holding two jobs to pay their way through school, and then you have all the admiration in the world. But I really do feel that those extracurricular things, volunteering and being in the community, being visible and networking, are essential to your success, no matter what business you're in. It's been wonderful being with all of you. I appreciate being invited. Oh, thank you.